<laughs> okay, so I'd like to welcome everybody to the conversations on social issues. And to, this is the first of our weekly library um, series for this quarter. I'm Sharon Spence Wilcox, I'm a librarian here. And just a quick intro we see the series, the social conversation on social issues series. It's an extension of the library's charge to promote freedom of information and the open exchange of ideas. And though none of us, thank you, none of us will agree with every single thing that's written in this library and the databases that we provide, we do it so that the community can have, can, can learn from the wide range of information that's out there. And this same philosophy extends to space. So not just what we buy, but the space we provide and the people that we invite in. We want to have a wide range of perspectives and we encourage you to express your own opinions about what you hear this afternoon, but do that in a respectful way. Everybody has something to say. You can open up and share what you like to say. And this way we can learn about the topic from each other. So before we get started, next week's uh, Next week's presenter is going to be, I left my paper over here, it's going to be Carl Livingston, our political science faculty member, and he's going to be speaking about the rediscovery of the primacy of economic development and civil rights. But right now, today, we have Joshua Ferris, Olu Thomas, and Bryce. 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 Okay. <laughs> and the three of these guys are from safeinseattle.org and they're going to be talking about housing as a human right, the foreclosure crisis in King County. Take it away. Good afternoon everybody and thank you for being here. Apologize for the delay in getting started, but we're here. So we're here mainly because we believe that there is a crisis going on right now. Uh, with housing and homelessness and uh, foreclosures and I'm sure many of you would agree with me that there is a crisis. We're concerned that there isn't enough attention, enough awareness about the issue and it's something that we want to bring people to be and become aware of it and uh, that's exactly why we're here. We want to talk about it. We want to bring it up to the uh, we have actually been dialoguing with the city council members, the power that, be that can make a change, and it's a really slow process. They're responding as slowly as they can. We want to move it, we want people to get involved, and uh, that's why we're here. Who here thinks uh, housing is a crisis? I'd like to say show of hands. Thank you, I think you tend to agree with me, it's a problem. So that's where we are. I'm going to pass it to Josh. Let him get started on that. Well, there's, um, there's something called the Committee to End Homelessness in King County. They, uh, they started this committee as a committee of a committee to uh, come up with a plan to end homelessness in King County in 10 years. And they're now into their, I guess they're going into their ninth year now. And homelessness in King County has never been higher. Uh, rents have never been higher. And uh, now there are more empty houses, more empty bank-owned houses, than there are uh, people sleeping on the streets at night. And there's going to be another uh, count of the homeless coming out in a couple of uh, weeks. I think actually next week. Next week. And uh, last last uh, year, there was uh, 2,700 people that were found sleeping on the streets in al in alleys, and entryways, doorways, um, and. Uh, we have been uh, doing canvassing, talking to uh, neighbors that are basically uh, fighting displacement, they're fighting the banks to stay in their homes. And um, we, uh, for, we, we uh, looked at it and estimated that there's more than 3,000 empty houses than there are. You know, so that more empty houses than there are homeless people sleeping on the streets. So this is, a, this is a terrible crisis of capitalism. Uh, this is where like when you, when you think about how there are CEOs <coughs> more than a thousand times what the lowest paid person in the company makes, or the profits for uh, the largest uh, transnational corporations in the world at all time highs, um, while we have jobless problems 
problems of low wage, rising <laughs> costs of living. This is a, a, a crisis of extreme social and economic uh, uh, inequality. And, uh, and housing uh, is really important because that's really, I mean, that's a fundamental need, uh, you know, to have shelter. With, um, and everybody should have, have shelter. And for people that attempt to uh, own, become homeowners, the, the house is, uh, is their store of their life's labor. Um, over time, you know, they may own the house or they um, may have $150,000 of their life's wages that have gone into the house. And so their wealth, their retirement, their, it's all stored in their homes. And with, uh, with health care being a disaster, as it is in this country, without us having universal health care, um, it's only one illness or one job loss, and then all of a sudden, you're facing um, housing displacement, and the banks uh, incentivize, they, they're quick to take people's homes. And they actually, there was a whistleblower last year that came out from uh, Bank of America that uh, claimed that Bank of America, the biggest of, of, the biggest of the big ones, was incentivizing foreclosing on people rather than negotiating uh, settlements. And as you may all know, uh, if you can remember Occupy, the banks got bailed out. And uh, they took billions and billions of dollars. And there continues to be a printing press being run at the Federal Reserve to subsidize their extreme uh, bonuses and, and profits uh, at the expense of uh, everyone else in society. So this, this thing, this project that we're working on, SAFE, uh, is, really comes out of the Occupy movement. And people talk about what happened to Occupy, well, you're looking at it. And uh, that conflict between Wall Street and uh, everybody else. <coughs> Olu, Olu Thomas is, is representing a household that is on, a, on the front lines of that, of that really, that battle. So. I'm aware of an organization, we do believe that housing is a human right, just like breathing and water and all of the basic human needs. But I don't think everybody believes in that, especially the powers that make the determination about what happens, how things get processed. So we're going to try and open it up for coming. Bryce, Bryce, maybe you'd like, yes. to, Bryce, maybe you'd like to tell yes. people how we fight back against the, uh, the banks. So basically, uh, the way it's safe is based on an organization called City Life in Boston and has been doing the same thing for about six years. So our model is to bring together you know, people that are affected by the crisis together, build an organization from the ground up based on the principle of mutual aid. So it's not a charity or social service. The idea is people helping each other, building power. Um, there's kind of, we talk about we have a defensive and an offensive strategy like, like a football team or a sports team. And uh, de the defensive strategy is like, you know, t letting people know what their legal rights are and, and working with uh, lawyers. The difficulty with that is that, you know, a lot, there are a lot of free lawyers out there, not a lot, but some, to help people in foreclosure. They're actually being paid by a settlement from the bank. And it's not like they don't want to help people at all, but they're, they're kind of in this role of having to defend a system that doesn't work because that is what they do for the livelihood, and um, and they and they don't they're not willing to take it very far. They'll look at someone's house who's like already been auctioned, it's already been foreclosed on, and they'll say, "Oh, you should take cash for keys," which is where the bank gives someone like three thousand bucks to leave their house. You know, we we say if we say don't do that, you, you know, you can don't believe these letters the banks are sending you and what people are telling you. You can stay in that house for as long as you stay in that house. And uh, so we organize, we use direct action, we do demand deliveries to banks and other institutions, and then we do uh, campaigns of like public protests, uh, pickets, and we're even willing to do a, the, an eviction blockade, which we did last May in South Park, where people literally stand in between the sheriff and the house. We were actually able to, to stay there for 10 days get a stay. They ended up taking it eventually anyways, but I mean the cost of the bank was huge. 
this very moralizing thing brought lots of people together. So I think uh, you know we're finding that the while the, there are important things that go on in Olympia or DC or in the world of kind of official politics, that the power to really solve these problems has to be built from the ground up, from ordinary people coming together and using uh, public pressure. Uh, the uh, the one per the one case we really should uh, mention too is uh, Louisa Telefoni. She uh, she's uh, head of a Tongan household. That there was like about five different families that lost their homes, and um, her house was sort of like the center of the Tongan community for a long time. They established the first Tongan uh, church, and uh, and uh, Louisa's brother is married to the princess of Tonga. And the king of Tonga, when he visited America, he had dinner in that house. So the house is very important to the Tongan community. Well, they took all these people in because in Tonga, basically, there's no homeless. They, they, housing is a human right. Everybody, they all share, and they all take care of one another. So Louisa had more than 20 people living in her house. And next to her house, on this, uh, on the end of this cul-de-sac that her family has always kept safe and taken care of. There was an empty uh, house that Wells Fargo had previously closed on. And uh, so it was just sitting there empty. And meanwhile, Louisa's got 20 something people in her house. And so what they did was they just moved the family back in to the next house, to that, em to that empty house. And they took an extension cord from their house and ran it across the lawn to that house. And they made the, ba the, the basement, which is a large space, uh, in that house into their uh, their community church. And uh, Bryce and I, uh, this is the second year I've gone to that. They, they had the Tongan New Year, they celebrate, they feast for five days straight. And, and every night they start with a large ceremony where they sing and it's really powerful. And then they have uh, a feast that different members of the family prepare all, all five days of the week. And uh, you know, so this house, they basically just took it back and now, and they and they've reoccupied this house. We also attempted to do this with Jeremy after after the eviction was uh, carried out. Shama Sawant, myself, Lauren Tozy, and Dorley Rainey were all arrested by the sheriff, and it was more of a dog and pony show. They arrested us and they released us on the street corner. Uh, it was a, mostly a show for the press so that the uh, sheriff could feign to kind of care about, you know, not to kind of protect his public image because it was election year for him. Well, you know, we were actually serious about defending Jeremy's house, so we implemented something similar that they've been working on in Portland. And the next week, we moved him back into that house publicly, and then the uh, the SPD was called in to evict uh, Jeremy the second time. No one was arrested, but um, it was very problematic, and it shows that we have to put pressure on on the mayor's office and the uh, city attorney to call off the SPD and, and uh, realize that these are civil land disputes and that the SPD has no right to evict uh, our people from uh, uh, our homes. So this is, this is a, these are ways in which we are pushing uh, beyond uh, these illegal and, well, these immoral laws and uh, struggling for uh, the higher cause of housing as human right. Um, if I could add one little thing. Part for Pete Knutson's benefit, but also because Knutson's benefit, but also because it's true. Like a big part of the work in SAFE is the messaging of it. So we make lots of uh, creative signs, banners, posters. We uh, you know put out newsletters and stuff. We make try to make songs, chants because uh, a big part of it is this kind of battling the message of the banks and the kind of mainstream society that says, oh, you should feel ashamed of yourself. It's uh, you against the world. If you fail, it's your fault. And uh, so you know, we're always trying to counter that message and appeal to a broad you know, layer of people that could, would see us on the street or uh, on the news or you know anywhere in public. open it up for questions at this point. This um, what is a really good resource for learning about squatters' rights in the city and in King County because of 
you know, I uh, actually purchased a, a book from Left Bank recently about um, uh, people that have done this successfully and, that, and ways to work the system so that this can happen because of all these homes that are um, empty and like, what are, what are some resources for that? I believe the tenants union might be the best bet for now, and if they won't be because they they have legal issues, they have legal battles with writers, and I believe uh, squatters will fall into the same categories. So the tenants' rights association will do that. Also, push back uh, at, at, in Olympia. I think uh, it was a year, a little, a little over a year and a half ago, the bank's lobbyists tried to get some sort of legislation that would have criminalized squatting to a much higher extent. Uh, it didn't make it very far, but the banks are th already thinking about this. You know, they're, they're thinking about how they can sort of protect uh, their, their private property from these uh, people that just didn't need shelter. So th there's, th there's a lot to talk about there. Yeah. So I agree with you somewhat <coughs> in the sense that I disagree with predatory lending and think that's something that so corporate America has rest of us, um, but you said that healthcare, or not healthcare, that housing is a fundamental human right. And that's a pretty bold statement. I was wondering if you can defend that at all. Why do you defend this? Well, they, um, it's, it's in the Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the U.S. Uh, Human Rights Forum, I believe, uh, six years ago. Well, you can look this up on Take Back the Land. There's an extreme, uh, good idea. Yeah, it's Take Back the Land. And uh, Max uh, Rameau, uh, who was featured in Capitalism, a love story, I think, especially the extra credit for special features, there's a long interview in there with him. He talks about this and he explains, like, basically, like, academically and ethically and philosophically, like, why this, and legally, even and based upon, like, you know, international laws, why this is, is so. But, I mean, just looking at it from a basic, a basic level of, like, of like a critique of capitalism. If you have uh, a surplus of empty houses that are sitting rotting and blighting, you know, in neighborhoods where blackberry bushes are growing over the backs of the houses and people go in there and they're using meth or, or the, uh, spray painting uh, racial hate speech on the, on the walls, as we saw at, at um, Pam's, uh, next to Pam's house where a Latino uh, family was thrown out of the house and it sat empty for two years. Next door to Pam, who's a single mother, black woman, her, her, uh, her, her house next to her, there was N word, stay over there, and all this stuff inside the house, and it and it became a like a place where people would throw their garbage, and it was actually a really beautiful home that this uh, this uh, family had lived in for 20 years, and now it's just sitting there rotting, and the banks would prefer that it sit and rot and that nobody lived there. And somebody else living there. And so, if you have like a surplus of housing, and yet, like, there's all these people that are sitting that are on the streets, that I think right there in itself tells us that there that, that that's a problem that, that and, and a big defense for housing being right. Well, I hear what you're saying about homelessness, and correct me if I'm wrong, but are you saying that when a baby is born, it's government responsibility to provide housing for that baby? One way to look at it, though, is that is it the government's right to enforce homelessness, right? Is it the government's uh, is it the government's responsibility to enforce predatory lending and housing displacement? And I would say I would say absolutely no. I think the government's responsibility is to uh, basically look after the society's welfare and and try to you know ensure that there is a society for posterity. Which is, I, I think that's actually in the thesis statement of the Constitution. I, I think that it should be, it is a fundamental right. And I think that uh, when a kid is born, if they do not have housing, I believe 
that it should be up to society to get that kid housing. Um, how does that happen? It's got to be changed. But everyone, I believe, should have the right to housing. The kids don't even, how are they going to even understand what a house is when they can't even know the school, but they need shelter. And um, can look at other societies that do provide for their, their people. Um, it's just, I, I think it's common sense that everyone should have a house, and it's part responsibility of the government also if they are in need and they, um, I mean, we pay taxes. I mean, you know, our money goes and goes. Sometimes it needs to come back. Um, that, that's just my opinion. Yeah. Uh, as to the, the question of uh, whether uh, everyone has a right to housing, I, I think it would help to turn that over and say, is it anyone else's, you know, government or non-government, uh, is it anyone else's right to say you may not take shelter and to uh, use force to prevent someone from taking shelter? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I heard you guys say King County. Do you know of anything up in Snohomish County by chance? Because I actually have a housing foreclosure that was supposed to be sold. Um, like two or three times last year, and it didn't get sold, and now I got a notice that it's going to be sold um, in May of this year. So I'm just wondering if you guys know of anything up in that direction that may be helpful. Well, we don't have particular resources for that area, but we're trying to uh, bring people together in the same area who can do exactly what we are doing in this area, and all you need to do is to stay in your home. If you stay in your home, then you fight the banks, since you're making it easy for them when you leave, so we don't have resources to answer your questions, but you can work with us, and uh, we also can work with you. Um, and the group in Boston, City Life, um, has like five or six uh, chapters around the region. Uh, yeah, it takes a lot of work, but it is a uh, growing movement uh, and responding to it and we need the society to uh, fight back. And, and I, I'm not someone who has a house in foreclosure, but I do see it as connected to me because, I, I mean, I rent a house that could be foreclosed on. I see that in the city of Seattle, more and more it's condos for the rich and there's not places for working people to live. And you know you can see how the banks and the <coughs> corporations are just squeezing people from a variety of directions. Like we're taking your job and your house and uh, your health. Um, you know, it's all very much interconnected, and it's a great opportunity to be involved in this to kind of you know hit back at uh, and, and to build a community together with other people. Yeah. And so there's a safe in Seattle, but um, I think there should be a safe in Tacoma, absolutely, because Tacoma is one of the hardest hit uh, cities in the country. Uh, Detroit has already been devastated. Uh, Chicago, there's the Chicago Anti-Eviction Network, mm -hmm. which also supported supported by uh, Occupy uh, Rogers Park, and, and uh, then there's uh, the Occupy Our Homes Atlanta. Occupy Our Homes Minneapolis has had huge success. They 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 got on this right away. Um, so that, and then, and, and as well, City Life was way ahead of the game on this because they came out of, you know, almost 40 years of tenant organizing, and they knew that basically the housing crisis was something they had to get on. So they've been on that for six years, and and they started in Jamaica Plains, and so they have uh, City Life Boston, and then they now they have City Life in Brockton and the different places in Massachusetts. So they're they they're they're expanding, but it's all base building. It's, it's basically, you know, you need to get that one or two people in that area that decide, you know, we got to organize, we got to do something. And then you got to start talking to your neighbors and then start talking to the people that are in the same situation as you. And then the, there's millions of people in the country that are basically facing housing displacement. So it's easy to, to organize and to uh, reach out and, and to start the base. And maybe we could support you in that. I don't, I don't know. In response to what he said, I think beyond like everyone has like a civil right to have a home, it's like I think people have as as human beings we have we should have like an understanding of not taking advantage of people in weak situations and people that aren't as privileged as other people. It's it's not like oh you should live for free, but it's like if you see someone in a situation and they're struggling, you don't need to take advantage of that and. Especially when you're a bank and you have money and you have resources and you could probably provide for that 
that person, why would you feel the need to take something from someone? Like, that's... That you're not gonna use. Yeah, I don't know. Especially when it's a family. And what happens is just a single injury can make a big yeah. difference. It's privilege is, is, yes. privilege is something that isn't, you, it's not like, it's, I don't know. Well, it's the prior, it's the, you're putting the priority of corporations and big money over <coughs> children and people with like livelihood and maybe they're sick and they're coming across hard times or people who are mentally ill who have no means to support themselves and like, it just seems like if you take it out of this like theoretical place where you're deciding like, why does a huge corporation with like this huge surplus of money get to decide like, who lives and who dies and who gets like to sleep in a warm place. And it just kind of sounds really inhumane to come out of much stuff. And I think a big thing to consider is that just as a society in the developed world in the United States, we don't want to account for the externalities that we create from our actions. In investing in a corporation and buying that luxury condo, we're taking up space, we're supporting organizations that are limiting people. If you buy a condo in Belltown, what land are we taking up that could have been allocated for more people that could that actually need housing? So in taking our actions, we're causing these issues, we're supporting that, each and every one of us. It's not so much other people are irresponsible and they're not making the money they need, it's that the actions we take now are making it increasingly more difficult for people who are struggling to take action, to have space, to have a home. So in hiding those externalities and in supporting policies and governments that don't allow us to create shanty towns, we as a society in Seattle, we don't want to see shanty towns like in developing nations. That's gross. That's a third world problem. That's something we see on TV. So even if these people who really want housing, they could try to scrap together and make their own little shanty town and make a home. But we don't want to see that. We're going to raise that. We're going to push that out. So people who even want to they can't put the resources together to at least create makeshift housing for themselves, and that's why we find people who are just left out in the cold. Well, that, and the, one of the things uh, SAFE does, we try to build a lot alliances with other organizations, and one of those was, is Nicholsville, which was a, it's a homeless encampment, or houseless, as they like to say, because they don't consider themselves homeless, per se, um, but houseless. They, you know, they, they're trying to form their own encampment that has like their own laws, rules their own democracy. It has some standards like, you know, if you're on a sex offender list or you're, you're actively using drugs, we don't want you here. And, you know, they came under a very harsh attack by both city government and, and, and social service agencies that, in my opinion, were sort of like, like you were saying, they're embarrassed to see their job is supposedly to help the homeless, so they're embarrassed to see, well, here's 150 of them uh, living in the middle of Seattle in a political state. So, I mean, they... They decided not to resist their conviction. We were willing to help them if they did. And they got, you know, it got dispersed, which, which is sad. But, uh, you know, they're still out there. There's, so there's a movement for, you know, the homeless that's um, in, along with the movement of people that are still in houses. They're, they're kind of very shy. Yeah. How can people like us contribute to your organization? So we're passing around a sign-up sheet. So if you want to, if you would like to get involved, we're requesting for you know support in different ways. We have actions. We have uh, regular actions that we focus on banks and the auction protest that happens uh, in Bellevue. And you know you can donate. You can become a part of the organization by you know being just being a member. When you come to one of our meetings, we have meetings every Tuesday. Evening, uh, our headquarters on Beacon Avenue. Um, so that's how you can learn a little more about the organization. There are different kind of work group that you can be a part of. And also, uh, tomorrow at 4:30, we are going to be picketing the uh, the Bank of America in Columbia City, uh, Alaska, and we're going to meet at Alaska every year. And uh, we will be doing that tomorrow, Friday, and then. Yeah. Did you say you're going to be evicting it? Oh, well, that would be funny. Yeah. That would be funny. <laughs> we might say we're doing that, but we're probably not. We're not quite there yet. We'll be thinking about that. What you have to think about, though, with all of this is without these corporations, we wouldn't have the America that we do right now. You know, as bad as they are and the things that they do, they are still supporting the economy. In some way, they're holding America up to the standard that America wants to have. You know, none of us can have the lives that we do without this country.
whether or not it is really great life with a lot of money or not so great life with money. Well, I mean, I think the way I would see it is that it's not so much the corporation, which is not a person, it's an entity. It's the workers that go to work every day at, you know, different private and public institutions that make the world around. Well, exactly, but without that corporation, those people wouldn't have anywhere to go to work. Yeah, those what, are the what same corporations that got bailed out, remember, by this fund. What, yes, is a, what is a corporation other than the structuring of individuals? and but the individuals who are creating the products, the merchandise, are still the ones who are in charge of the primary output of that corporation. Yes, there's deciding individuals up top, but everything starts from the bottom and goes up in a corporation. The money on the other side doesn't go that way. I mean, it all goes to the top. So yeah, there's, I mean, a co-op on the other hand is completely different. A corporation is a completely different. It's 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 not. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's it's an entity, but it's it shouldn't be large enough to where it its GDP is larger than a small country. It should not. Yeah, that's very true. Otherwise, Can I have somebody else say something from there? Can I help? Can you help me? Yeah, I think so. Did you have me? Oh, uh, it was just in response to saying that. We have uh, what she said about having corporations to thank for the America that we have today. Um, it's just interesting to look at that the other way. Like uh, a lot of people have really, really terrible lives, and they can thank that for the corporations that we have today. So maybe uh, not to. Uh, I just think uh, it doesn't make sense to defend, um, maybe not targeting corporations, uh, I kind of lost what I was saying though. Yeah. I, just, I also think that it's in, like, it could have worked in other ways, it didn't have to turn out that way. And if, if you learn about the way that corporations were about, like, it's these people that either rose to the top or were born into a situation with like, a lot of money and they took advantage of weaker people. The point about corporations is that they provide jobs, but they could have always provided more. They always fought to provide health care. They always fought to provide the least amount of money that they possibly could have. If corporations did that to begin with, there would be a completely even level field at this point. So yeah, we have corporations to thank for the way that America is today, but who is to say that's the best way that America can be? That's the issue. That is the problem. <laughs> What if like, uh, the, like there are homeless people who are not like not everybody homeless people are willing to have home actually. It's kind of like from the personal experience because I have a friend who used to live in homeless shelter for six months because well he's an international student and he didn't do good in his like a school thing and his parents just cut up the sending money like that. So he had an experience that he's telling me. And some of people like in you know, the homeless, like who have like a little bit more money than other people do, like a couple hundred dollars in their whole account. They like uh, I said the homeless shelter life is so like a ter like a terrible. They have to like use some drugs, and then some of them just keep using drugs and then listen to the music, like uh, like yeah, smoke, like drink, and I'm really rich like that. And then they really think that they're rich in homeless shelter, and then they kind of look down and they don't see the need of home. And then I was wondering if there was any like a education or like a mental treatment or like a talking to actual like homeless girl or homeless people and listening to why it happened and then see the find the reason why it actually happened because I don't think every homeless people want it that way maybe if they were living in a very rich house some people may have but ended up in that way and I was wondering if there was like any like treatment or mental or yeah just so say that I don't know if anybody who would rather be out there in the cold when it's like 20 degrees as opposed to being in a home that is warm and comfortable. There's nobody. So a lot of people who are homeless are there not necessarily by their actions or, you know, and I know people are, the, people are partially responsible for some of their actions. Some of them are mentally challenged in a lot of ways and there's a lot of help from the homeless shelters to try and support, you know, what 
issues they're going with and see how they can get help. And so there is that help. And then there's a lot of agencies, that social service agencies that's helping out in that area. But I think primarily most people would rather not be homeless and I, than be homeless. But what about the people like uh, they are afraid of the judgment in society? Like in this homeless shelter, they because they have a little bit more money than others, they think they're rich, so they in that area they are like really coolest. But when they actually have a job and they can afford, I mean, have a house, still living in, but they can afford and like not having really big payment like that. What what if still the judgment of them they're scared for like they don't need a desire or like. Okay, we're just going to take one more question, but uh, quickly, uh, you know, like in the, in the South, uh, during the period of slavery, the, uh, the, the, the poor were divided, you know, there was, there was the, uh, the, the sharecroppers that were fairly, fairly above uh, slaves in some cases, and then there was the slaves. And then the, and within, within slavery, of course, there's different levels, there's a different level of, of slave. There's the slaves that work out in the fields, and then there's the slaves that work in the house. And then of course, right, the, the white uh, sharecroppers who are out there with just barely, barely surviving, they're so thankful that they're not slaves, and yet they're working uh, you know, themselves to death just trying to survive. So there's a whole thing where like, you know, people are divided and they're looking at each other, we're like, at least I don't have it as bad as that person or that group. At least I'm in a homeless shelter and I'm not out on the streets. And then you know this is a, this is ways in which the system the system encourages division and fragmentation. And uh, the Romans uh, called it uh, you know, divide and conquer, divide a epidemic, I believe. So I mean it's something that, that has been used to control people for thousands and thousands of years. And you see it right here in Seattle with this sort of this type of psychology that you're referring to. And it's just, that's an astute observation. So last last question, and then we'll I wrap up. Want to uh, like as much as possible, uh, like instead of like saying corporations or banks, like talk about specific a specific corporation in mind or specific person where we can perhaps get more uh, detailed or accurate. Because like, generalized statements about like, corporate corporations or banks don't always like make sense or sort of have uh, like you know with a specific example you can have like facts and uh, get more accurate uh, you know that's a good point uh, what we try to do actually is we try to simplify the message there is uh, there are people that get totally wrapped up in exposing the fraud of these corporations and, and uh, banks and figuring out if they can just prove how they're still in their homes. But we, you know, in the soundbite media, you know, you're lucky if you're gonna get two seconds, let alone a chance to actually really defend and explain why what's happening is, is criminal. And and the lawyers and the lawyers that work for the banks are a lot better at that than than we can. I mean they you know. So it's so as activists we try to really simplify uh, what what it is we're, we're doing in in this movement. What, what it is, what, what it is that we're fighting for, and uh, so I'll close this out real quick. Uh, Columbia City, uh, we're meeting up in front of the library at 4:30, uh, having a protest, at, uh, and then that's going to be a regular uh, uh, putting pressure to direct action campaign against the DA. And at that point, UCC, we meet up on Tuesday, and you can help contribute to uh, the movement building work we do. And during our meetings. Uh, what we what we try to do too is we try to turn shame into a culture of defiance, and we encourage people to fight back. And uh, we always close our meetings out with a, a solidarity chant, and um, I'll show you that. So uh, this in this one, we uh, we always say when we fight, we win. Um, but you may not you may not actually win the fight for your house, but we're winning because we're building a movement, we're supporting each other. And we're and we're taking on the most powerful corporations in the world, and we're, and we're winning. So, when we fight, we win.